British towns and cities were transformed in the 19th century with the factors of social change, migration, mining and industrial production leading to dramatic urban development. Sheffield epitomised this transformation. The pace of change was staggering. Where the population of Britain doubled from 1801 to 1851, in Sheffield it trebled. It increased from 111,000 in 1841 to half a million in 1921. By the start of the 20th century, Sheffield's population was larger than that of other longer established British cities such as Bristol, Newcastle or Liverpool. With these changes came the new forces of industrial labour, as well as poverty, exclusion, environmental degradation and disease. The Cholera Monument in Sheffield commemorates the 400 dead from an 1832 outbreak of the disease associated with poverty and overcrowding. To try to counter the epidemic of poverty, in 1926 Sheffield became the first local authority in Britain to be controlled by the Labour Party. In this short film we will explore three themes that express the social forces that have shaped Sheffield and South Yorkshire, mining and manufacture, migration and municipal identity, as we take a tour through the contemporary city and its surrounding area. Here, on the outskirts of Sheffield, the clamour of the city centre seems a long way away. In contrast to other British cities, Sheffield is not characterised by extensive outskirts of ribbon development, but instead opens out onto the rolling hills of the Peak District. Just like the Australian town of Bendigo, the city of Sheffield prides itself on its closeness to the rural. It was this rural environment that helped sculpt the city into an industrial powerhouse, its array of natural resources combining to make Sheffield the perfect centre for metal manufacturing. With its steep hills and valleys, the fast-flowing waters of Sheffield's five rivers, the Don, Riverlin, Sheaf, Loxley and the Porter, powered the wheels of the early grinders. There was also an abundance of millstone grit for grinding wheels, coal for power, iron ore deposits for raw material, limestone used for flux in the steel process, as well as extensive woodland. The silver birch trees that grow all around Sheffield provided charcoal for smelting. Today, Sheffield has more trees per head of population than any other European town or city, a reminder of the role of timber in industrial production. With its relative tranquillity today, it seems strange to think that from around the 1850s to the 1970s, sites like these across Sheffield would have been home to a noisy industrial landscape of metal manufacturing. Callum Island in Sheffield, a preserved industrial site, provides a living legacy of this industrial past. Small-scale metal working for cutlery, edge tool manufacturing, shearing tools for export to Australia and elsewhere were based in the centre of town in hundreds of small workshops. The small-scale capital investment required for the implementation and operation of these workplaces meant that there were very few large-scale employers in Sheffield during the Industrial Revolution in comparison with the cotton or textile industries of Lancashire. As a consequence, the industrial structure of Sheffield developed around a large number of small-scale entrepreneurs or little mesters a common theme among historians is that there was less distance in Sheffield between employer and employee, making for a shared lifestyle and outlook. In that sense, Sheffield is a very homogenous working class city. In 1861, 60 trades unions were represented in the city. There were 56 sick clubs with a membership of 11,000 in 1843, as late as the 1960s, more people were employed in the manufacturing industry in Sheffield than any other sector. 
Walking through a site like this today, we get a sense of the environmental destruction wrought by manufacturing in Sheffield, the scars on the landscape, and the degradation of the urban and rural landscape that came with it. Mining was central to the coal excavation process that enabled the smelting of iron ore. Locally, the industry moved from open cast mining to deep mines. Eventually, miners and coal companies sank shafts further and further underground, enabling extraction of deeper coal seams. As the shafts extended, mining became more dangerous with major disasters like those in the neighbouring Barnsley area at Lundhill Colliery in 1857, where 189 men and boys lost their lives, and at the Oaks Colliery in 1866, where the sound of the pit explosion was likened to a volcanic eruption and which, according to recent research, killed over 380. By 1895, nearly every settlement in the South Yorkshire area had been subjected to some form of coal mining. So, just who were the workers in the mines and the metal workshops in Sheffield and South Yorkshire in the 19th century? Sheffield was far more geographically isolated than other industrial cities. Only neighbouring Rotherham continuously joined Sheffield, making it the largest city in the country that was not a conurbation. The pattern of migration into Sheffield was one that drained people from nearby rural districts of Derbyshire, Yorkshire and Lincolnshire, but seldom from further afield. The physical isolation of Sheffield added to the notion of a city that looked in on itself rather than to a region as a whole. Sheffield was frequently seen as an insular place or as a city resistant to outside influences and ideas. This view was evident well into the 20th century. A 1934 Ministry of Health report on Sheffield noted the idiosyncratic outlook of the population attributed to the city's myopic qualities. The people are in the main of a stubborn nature, very independent, very self-willed, capable of being led with care but not easily driven. Sheffield's strong identity as an inward-facing city abutting the Peak District bred a politics that intersected with the dynamics of rural life in the Peaks. Rural and feudal landholding patterns persisted in Sheffield. The Duke of Norfolk owned the land the city centre was built on and market rights in the city until 1899. Rambling, walking and outdoor recreation in the Peak District also led to mass trespass campaigns like that at Kinder Scout in 1932 to throw off aristocratic control of the open moorland and uplands of the Peak District. The first branch of the Council for the Preservation of Rural England was established in Sheffield and campaigned for one of the first green belts in England. After the Second World War, the first of Britain's national parks was established in the Peak District under the National Parks and Access to the Countryside Act of 1949. By the 1870s, Sheffield had established its own municipal identity. However, it is a relatively understated city. Much of the subdued civic architecture of the city centre is a legacy of the type of small-scale workshop manufacture located there. The city was devoid of the grand temples of Victorian commerce that added to the civic splendour of the great urban commercial centres. Victorian Sheffield did not have the corn exchange of Leeds, the wool exchange of Bradford, the customs houses of Liverpool, the Peace Hall of Halifax, or the Grand Art Gallery and Town Hall of Manchester. Neither did Sheffield possess the gigantic warehouses and mills of the towns of Lancashire and the West Riding. The art critic John Ruskin was moved to ask the working men of Sheffield in 1877, why haven't you a ducal palace of your own in Sheffield? 
Instead, the ingenuity and craft tradition of Sheffield was expressed through the Cutler's Hall, a work of municipal extravagance that showcased the cutting-edge design and attainments of cutlers in Sheffield. Whilst having its fair share of civic worthies commemorated in civic monuments and statues, the strong working class craft and artisan tradition in Sheffield is demonstrated by statues to workers and agitators like Ebenezer Elliot, the Corn Law Rhymer, writer of political protest songs and poems, James Montgomery, a radical and anti-slavery campaigner, and the Women of Steel Monument, erected in 2016 to commemorate the central role of women in wartime steel production during the First and Second World Wars. Like other British cities, Sheffield has had to come to terms with a painful process of de-industrialisation and decline in its staple industries. King Coal ended its economic dominance when, across South Yorkshire, the majority of mines closed down in the 1970s and 1980s. They exist now only in memory. Quite literally, mining is a museum industry, represented in Yorkshire by the National Coal Mining Museum at Wakefield. A pride in industrial heritage, though, remains not just in the city of Sheffield, but across South Yorkshire. Industrial heritage remains central to the life of the city to this day, and sites like Kellam Island offer a daily reminder of the ways in which the city once made its money. The majority of the city's residents now find employment in the service sectors of health, tourism, banking and education. Sheffield hosts one of the largest student populations in the United Kingdom. Both Sheffield universities and the city's hospitals have become major employers. So it's fitting that we end up here to conclude at Sheffield Hallam University.